We met Imad through another agent that had worked with him before. She said that he was a very good guy, trustworthy, former Egyptian army officer who immigrated to the United States. Now he was the head of security at a hotel. You cannot imagine how happy I was to, as just a new American citizen, that the FBI wanted my help. We were trying to penetrate this cell that we knew was dangerous. And we were trying to develop Ahmad as an asset to provide us with real-time intelligence that we could use to prevent an act of terrorism. Agents plant Ahmad outside the courthouse among Nocer's supporters. And Nocer's uncle, Ibrahim El Gabroni, takes the bait. I think within the first day or two being there, Ahmad was approached by Gabroni and asked him, I've, we've never seen you before, who are you, why, why are you here? Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! He responded that he was here to make amends with God for wasting his life serving a illegitimate government of, of Egypt. They recruit an informer who is more than informer. He's more like an operative. And how did you get these, um, these followers in front of uh, the courthouse to believe that you were like them, one of them, and get on the inside? Um, I established my entry point that I am an ex Green Berets and I'm a jeweler, and part-time I do electronic surveillance. Why a jeweler? Jewelers means I have money, and I know that they are after money. Why Green Berets? Green Berets, I know that either they want me to shoot somebody or they want me to build bomb. Um, third thing is I'm doing uh, uh, electronic surveillance because I might have recordings and uh, if I if they see some recording devices with me I don't want it to raise a red flag to not put yourself in a position where you would be considered conspiring that you had to walk a very fine line with not leading them to do things how did I, I know that we talked before about Antisev and Napoli there were very strict rules that you had to follow well I was very I was schooled very well by the special agents who were handling me. John Antisev, Louis Napoli, Nance Floyd, they schooled me not to suggest targets, not to suggest bombing, because that's called entrapment. All of that was new to me in the American law. So I start to learn quickly not to open, but to give open and questions to let them roll and give me the information needed, yet I don't want to jeopardize the case later on by suggesting then I'm leading them, and I learned that through my case agents. Aside from the probable example of Salem committing entrapment in the case of Sadig Ali within the New York landmark plot, Salem's motives aside for extravagant compensation does seem to show a nefarious side to him. But we also do have a public character witness of Salem who had quite a few personal encounters with him, Dr. M.T. Mehdi, or Mohammed Taki Mehdi, an Iraqi-born Arab-American who first came into the U.S. in 1954, attending UC Berkeley, studying politics, economics, and history, becoming director of the Arab Information Center in San Francisco. After traveling the country and dealing with setbacks and further education with the League of Arab States, while managing the office of the Organization of Arab Students, he became independent, which gave him liberty to put more time and devotion into becoming a grassroots political spokesman for the Arab cause in general and the Palestinians. Eventually basing himself in New York, Mehdi was hailed as the father of the Arab movement in America, as the founder and president of the American Arab Relations Action Committee, as one of the earliest, if not leading pro-Palestinian activists in the U.S. openly supporting the PLO. After the Kahana assassination and follow-up events in 1993, Mehdi gave counsel to the blind Sheikh and Nocer supporters, which put him right in the circles of Imad Salem. Mehdi frequently spoke to the press, and right after the initial bust with the New York landmark plot, several newspapers interviewed Mehdi on June 27, 1993, where he spoke candidly on what was verifiable about Salem's personal status, 
Separate from Salem's true intentions, Mehdi wasn't always able to detect. Based on how he carried himself around the blind Sheikh and followers, the post-star in Giant Falls, Double Agent in Bomb Plot Did Not Stay in Shadows by Tom Hayes, Associated Press. Saturday, a Muslim community leader who has known Salem for two years, M.T. Mehdi, charged at Salem was as much an instigator as he was an informant in the plot to assassinate political leaders and bomb sites throughout Manhattan. Salem helped recruit the suspected terrorist, then turned on them, said Mehdi. This was done without the Sheikh's knowledge, Mehdi said. He is a very polite and friendly, a lovable person, Mehdi said of Salem. He easily got the respect and trust of his fellow Muslims. The suspects were very open to suggestions, he said. It's likely that he has suggested to the frustrated men that they have an Islamic religious duty to do something against the evil power of America. What about blowing up a few buildings and tunnels in New York? The Boston Globe, Muslim FBI informant had high profile, by Globe staff Tom Ashburn. He is a warm and polite brother Muslim, but I fear he suffered from a split personality, said M.T. Mehdi. An Arab American activist who knows both Salem and the Islamic cleric Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. He did not infiltrate this group so much as organize and guide it, which is a violation of Islam. His disappearance was quickly noticed by the Muslims who frequent the mosque where Abdel Rahman preaches. Fluent in English, he had rushed to defend the men arrested in the February 26 bombing of the World Trade Center, and he acted as a translator when Rahman denied that Islamic teachings had prompted the attack. But in a recent interview with an Arab speaking reporter for New York One, an all news station, Salem hinted at why he might have turned on his friends, saying bitterly that the Trade Center bombing had given Muslims a bad name. Away from the Sheikh and cameras, according to a report in yesterday's issue of the New York Times, Salem was working with members of the Joint Terrorist Task Force, which referred to him by the codename, The Colonel. Clearly bruised by the seeming treachery of his friend, Mehdi said, He is a bigamist. He never divorced his Egyptian wife and she is suing him. To gain the confidence of the Muslim community, Mehdi said, Salem made it appear that he himself was under FBI surveillance by telling Muslim friends that agents had searched his home in connection with the Trade Center case. The depth of Salem's involvement in the alleged plot uncovered last week is sure to be an issue if the eight suspects are tried. William Kunstler said in court on Thursday that he sensed that his client, Sadig, had been set up. Even the criminal complaint against Sadig refers to the presence of a CI at every substantive meeting held in the alleged bomb plot. Salem drove Sadig everywhere and was influential in obtaining crucial bomb-making parts. I believe Salem suggested and encouraged these five disgruntled Sudanese nationals and three others to set up their bomb factory, Mehdi said. Asked about the possibility of entrapment defense, Mary Jo White, the assistant U.S. attorney handling the case, said, We've of course done all we can do to avoid that issue coming up at trial, but I can't say any more. Imad Salem was helping the feds on the inside, but he also seemed to be one of the more outspoken supporters of those arrested in the World Trade Center bombing. In fact, our Penny Crone spoke with him back in March at the arraignment of Mahmoud Abu Halima. At that time, Salem complained that he was being branded a bomber for being a supporter. The New Jersey record, Confidence Man, Aid to Sheikh Help Break Terror Ring by staff writers David Glovin and John Mooney. Salem also kept a high profile, making himself available to the press and giving interviews in support of the alleged World Trade Center bombers in his Manhattan apartment. But at the recent news conference, Salem did not appear to fit in with the Sheikh's usual crowd of wide-eyed followers. Although he was sweating profusely, he was juvenile and relaxed, appearing more self-assured than the other confidants who tend to dote on the Sheikh. For most of the time, Salem sat quietly at the rear of the room. I think he was against Sadat, his going to Jerusalem, his suppressing Egyptian intellectuals, said M.T. Mehdi. He's acting as a fireman who puts out a little brush fire in a nearby warehouse and goes to put it out, and he thereby appears as a hero, Mehdi said. During car rides to and from Brooklyn, Mehdi said, Salem, a former colonel in the Egyptian army, told him he had worked in internal security for Egyptian intelligence in the early 1980s and had been sent to train with the Green Berets in Georgia. Officials at the Egyptian consulate and embassy could not be reached to confirm this. These things are not contradictory, Mehdi said of Salem's work for the Egyptian government and Abdel Rahman. You can damn George Bush on one hand and support him on another. Reports on Saturday said Salem had philosophical differences with the alleged terrorist and the federal officials had pressured him to cooperate. Mehdi discounted the claims, however, saying Salem had a personality clash rather than a religious one with the suspects and was being sued by his wife for divorce because he had another wife in Egypt. Publicly, at least, Salem professed to oppose bombing. The children at school are picking on my children. He said in one television interview after the World Trade Center bombing, they say, you're a terrorist. What are you doing over here? You're a Muslim. You are bombers. Of course, my daughter came home and she was very upset. Salem, who wanted acquaintances to pronounce his name in an Americanized manner, 
Salem, rather than Arabic sounding Salem, was seeking permanent residency status in the United States, Mehdi said. He wanted to be a good Muslim and a good red-blooded American, he said. Mehdi, like Salem's neighbors in his Manhattan apartment, was stunned by the revelation. In Manhattan, Salem had lived what appeared to be a quiet and law-abiding life with his wife Karen, a jewelry designer, and their two children in what a neighbor said was an eight-room apartment. The San Francisco Examiner by Gene King of Reuters, terrorist who came in from the cold, was a Green Beret. Mehdi said that Salem, 43, was selected by the government to come here and get the specialized training in the early 1980s. A senior law enforcement official confirmed that Salem was the informer that he, his common-law German wife, and his two Egyptian-born children from his first marriage are in the Federal Witness Protection Program. Another source, close to the investigation, said Salem was being paid $1 million for his cooperation with authorities. He's getting big bucks, said a source. It's $1 million bucks. Salem said he was turning on his fellow Muslims because he didn't want innocent people getting hurt. Mehdi said Salem is seen in the Islamic community as a devout Muslim, but also as a soldier of fortune who is seeking, perhaps desperately, to escape both career and marital problems. Call him the terrorist who came in from the cold, he said. Mehdi said that Salem, a lieutenant colonel, left an apparently successful military career in Egypt and his first wife and came to the United States with her two children without permission or authorization from an Egyptian court. Salem became a U.S. citizen in 1992. But a month later, Mehdi got really in-depth with how far back he interacted with Salem, and that he himself knew about Mehdi, and even mingled outside the blind shake circles. The record, New Jersey, August 26, 1993. Mystery surrounds informant's role. He taped alleged terrorist by Pierre Thomas and Eleanor Randolph via Washington Post News Service. To some, Salem is a hero who saved New York from a second terrorist attack. This one potentially far more devastating than the World Trade Center bombing, with bombs planted at the United Nations and in the Holland and Lincoln tunnels. To others, including the accused who have declared they are not guilty, the self-proclaimed Egyptian Secret Service agent is a greedy opportunist who lured a group of angry young Muslims into his own terrorist fantasy and then sold the plot to the U.S. government for $500,000. Savior or huckster, informer or provocateur, Salem is at the center stage in the ever-widening conspiracy case which so far includes 15 defendants and involves plots not only to blow up buildings, but to assassinate Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. The transcripts of his conversation with those now in prison, as well as his private tapings of FBI contacts apparently for his own protection, are expected to determine whether Salem spied on men already planning the alleged plot or led them into it. The man saved the city, said one New York police administrator, who asked not to be named with the trial pending. There is no doubt that he saved lives. Far from infiltrating a terrorist group, he helped organize one, appealing to young innocent men who were vulnerable, said Mohammed Mehdi. Strange and unpredictable, Salem has left a trail of unsolved mysteries about who he is, where he came from, and what his motives were. I think Imad Salem works for Imad Salem, said Ronald Kuby trial attorney for Sadiq Ibrahim Sadiq Ali, accused as mastermind of the alleged plot to blow up the United Nations and other sites. A fast talker who worked his way into Abdel Rahman's inner circle, Salem easily won the confidence of the Sheikh's worry followers. In transcripts of tapes that have become available in recent weeks, Salem often questions the men, drawing out names and motives, but he also appeared to be boasting about his knowledge of explosives, including how much dynamite would be needed to blow up the United Nations. In an unrelated trial in Manhattan earlier this year, after Salem's auto was hit by a drunk driver, he told the court that during his time in the Egyptian Secret Service, before he came into the United States, he was trained to destroy things, such as ships. What other things were you trained in destroying, he was asked. Cars, planes, buildings, he answered. His foes don't simply call him a liar. But as Victoria Tonsing, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General and an expert on criminal prosecution said last week, these informers are con guys. They have to be people who are capable of creating another role. And in the context of his conversations with these people, it would be expected that Salem would be lying. That was the role he was supposed to play. But the primary issue here about his, Salem's words, is whether the defendant had a predisposition to commit the crime or whether there was entrapment. The informant talked to him, the accused, into it, she said. In a conspiracy case when there is no actual deed, like this one, the conversation becomes crucial, she said. The fact that the informer knew how to make bombs makes him more vulnerable to charges of entrapment, she said. But it's not the be-all, end-all. You have a defendant saying he wants to bomb the UN. Clearly he had already thought about it, and the informant is only making the means available to him. But David Lewis, a New York defense attorney, said that Salem's character could still become a key issue in the case, especially if the transcripts are confusing to a jury. In some cases, the first thing you do is snap the back of the informant, he said. If you cannot, the whole 
case goes bad for you. He was being developed by a confidential source, one law enforcement source said. There was a process, there was sporadic contact, developing trust. For the Muslims around Abdel Rahman, Salem just dropped out of nowhere three years ago. As a close associate of Abdel Rahman, Abdel Sattar, 33, put it, Several members of the New York Arab community recall seeing Salem first during Said Nosser's 1991 trial for the slaying of Rabbi Meir Kahana. Sometime in 1991, Mehdi, a supporter of Abdel Rahman, received a telephone call from Salem. He had seen me on television and he called to introduce himself, Mehdi said. He called me his grand brilliant father. He had the ability to endear himself to me, then gradually ask questions. I had great confidence in him. The Sheikh had great confidence in him. Mehdi said that Salem offered to be his bodyguard but he declined. Salem eventually became Abdel Rahman's occasional bodyguard, and even though some of Abdel Rahman's followers distrusted him, Abdel Rahman told them, we have nothing to hide, according to Sattar. Of course, there have also been some accusations still that Salem may have known when the Trade Center bombing was supposed to happen. According to a source close to the case, Ahmad Salem checked into a Manhattan hospital three hours after the blast, complaining of a severe ringing in his ears. A hospital spokesperson refuses to confirm or deny the report. On August 3, 1993, Paul Daranzo interviewed William Kunstler on the Let Them Talk radio program, where Kunstler revealed some details of what he heard on the Salem tapes, as well as some of his own speculations based on his investigation. Here's a transcript part of that interview. Kunstler said, I've read a lot of the tapes by now, transcriptions of the tapes, which were just furnished to me today. Before I came here, I read some of them, and there are things like having him, Salem say, well, I think we ought to bomb the George Washington Bridge. That's a very good target. It would make the commuters raise hell with this government of ours. And so then Sadig Ali says, Yeah? Salem. And I think so and so. Ali. Yeah? And so on. That's the way it goes virtually throughout these hundreds of pages of transcriptions. There are 150 hours of tapes. A lot of them are in Arabic. Some are in English. But this is the kind of man they're going to put on the witness stand. Daranzo responded, Kunstler adds that Salem was the recipient of between $250,000 and $1 million for his services as an informant, plus monies paid to him by other sources linked to foreign governments, including money from an organization founded by assassinated Rabbi Mara Kahana. Kunstler responded, He, FBI informant Imad Salem, also received money from Kahana Chai, Rabbi Meyer Kahana's group, probably from a lot of other people. Israeli Secret Service, the Mossad is not someone to exclude probably received money from the Egyptian government. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Egyptian army, which apparently he was. Two weeks after the World Trade Center blast, with the reopening of the Kahana case announced, Kahana Chai were making unfounded accusations about MT Mehdi, reported on March 15th. In the Daily News, militant kind of guy sought in World Trade Center blast by staff writers Michael Finnegan and Mark Mooney states, claims by investigators in Kahana Chai that MT Mehdi, head of the Arab American Relations Committee, met with Nosser two days before the Kahana killing. Mehdi yesterday denied having met with Nosser. Nosser's car was found parked in front of Mehdi's shortly after the Kahana killing. A prior police canvas of the area indicated the car was not there. Often brash in his defense of Palestinian causes, Mehdi often participated in debates on television and radio. When you go back and look at history, when you go back and look at the beginnings, for example, of the PLO, it is where you see and, and, and originally saw the beginnings of, of terrorism. As a matter of fact, the beginning of terrorism in the Middle East started with the creation of Israel. The whole establishment of Israel is an act of terrorism against the Palestinian people whose land has been taken over, they have been denied the normal human right to their land, and Palestinian hijacking takes place because in the first place the whole country of Palestine has been hijacked by the Zionist Jews with the support of the West. And amongst fervent supporters of Israel, including Meir Kahana. Dr. Mehdi, let us stop this nonsense. You may go over war with a Hadassah group, but not with me. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that we, that we created in Israel to be for a Jewish state, because we don't trust you. Now, I don't know how, how, how more blunt I can possibly be. We don't trust you. There will be much more on Imad Salem ahead, but coming back to William Kunstler, he maintained an assertion that Kahani was murdered by enemies within his own organization. And as you might imagine from what's already been told by one of Nosser's additional attorneys, Michael Warren, about receiving death threats from Kahani supporters, Kunstler had frequently suffered from those same repercussions, even up to his doorstep, as explained by Kunstler's daughters in their 2009 documentary, Immortalizing Their Father, William Kunstler Disturbing the Universe. I asked Dad if he thought Nosser was innocent. He told me that a lawyer never asks his client that question. 
This was one case he didn't even try to justify. He sort of morphed into representing the unpopular, almost any unpopular. And it didn't matter so much as to how you became unpopular. Why is he doing this? I mean, why is he representing those people? You know, aren't there still other cases of people we agree with out there? He lost a lot of uh, the liberal support that he had. And he was no longer the great civil liberties, civil rights lawyer. After the verdict, the Jewish Defense Organization staged daily protests in front of our house, shot out our front windows with red paint pellets, and called my father a self-hating Jew. Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! Is a traitor. But uh, it was scary. Kutzler there were police go. at either end Kutzler of the street. Must go. Kutzler must go! If there were protesters outside when I got home from school, I would pretend I didn't live there. I didn't want them to know I was his daughter. Dad went on to represent defendants charged with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and others indicted for a plot to blow up the Lincoln and Holland tunnels. No one supported him. So I hope you people will think of the questions that I don't have. Rabbi Meir Kahanan is perhaps the most well-known Jewish leader in the world and certainly the most controversial. His fame started in 1968 when he organized the Jewish Defense League, which became notorious for its militant activities against the Soviet Union, as well as for its self-defense patrols in the inner city, which were meant to protect poor and elderly Jews. Arrested many times for his beliefs and convictions, at one point he served 11 months in a federal prison. Prior to finding the JDL, in the late 1950s to early 60s, Kahane worked as an FBI informant himself, infiltrating the John Birch Society under the name Michael King. The JDL is a racist and oftentimes violent group of Jewish supremacists that's not part of mainstream Jewry, but they are known for violent demonstrations and also committing mainly domestic acts of terrorism. Gahana called the man a dirty Arab. Gahana often refers to Arabs as dogs. I want to make it clear to those dogs that are standing there, there is no such thing as an Arab village in the state of Israel. It gives us greater strength. And it's not going to be long before we have the power to clean this place out. And that's where I want them out, out, out. In 1975, Kahani was arrested for leading an attack on police outside the Soviet UN mission and injuring two officers. Later that year, Kahani was accused for conspiring to kidnap a Soviet diplomat, bomb the Iraqi embassy in Washington, and ship arms abroad from Israel. His probation for a 1971 firebomb-making incident was revoked, and Kahani was found guilty of violating probation and served a one-year federal prison sentence. A list of Kahani and JDL crimes are on the FBI website. Its members and leaders, including Kahane's multiple acts of terrorism, are so prominent and unavoidable that even the Eliel have them listed on their site. Many Israeli soldiers make little secret of their support for Kahana, as do some of the settlers. If I were the settlers, I would, I would rampage through this town and put the fear of God into these Arabs. On February 25th, 1994, exactly a year after the 93 World Trade Center bombing, during the overlapping religious holidays of both Jewish Purim and Muslim Ramadan, one former JDL member, devout follower of Kahane, a New York Jewish doctor who later became an Israeli settler named Baruch Goldstein, walked inside the Ibrahim Mosque at the Cave of the Patriarchs compound in Hebron while carrying an IMI Galil and opened fire on a large number of Palestinian Muslims gathered for prayer inside. A man wielding an assault rifle fires 110 rounds before a mob stops him, bludgeoning him to death with a fire extinguisher. Dr. Baruch Goldstein, a fanatical right-wing Jew from a nearby Israeli settlement, had killed 29 Palestinians and seriously wounded 70 others. Baruch reportedly swore to take revenge for the killing of Kahana, infamously now known as the Goldstein Massacre. In an interview with Israeli radio less than three months ago, he seemed to warn of today's attack. With the help of the Almighty, we will found the state of Judah, 
and then we will know how to deal with them on our own. Today, after the attack, Israeli militants hailed him as a hero, the son of Meir Kahani calling him a Samson of his time. Samson of his time, irrespective to Islamophobic propaganda. The history of terrorism started in Egypt by creating the Muslim Brotherhood as a political religious organization and they used violence to convey their message. As we have visited the beginning stages of what some have deemed as the roots of Islamic terrorism, that now subjectively to the American lexicon is equated to suicide bombers, what Kahana's son said about Goldstein is the prime example to show the unexpected fundamental polar opposite through Judaism. Based on the Old Testament character, or as what American audiences once remember sexualized with the story of Samson and Delilah, sometimes considered the Israelite version of Hercules, Samson, who's eventually captured by the Philistines, then tortured, and in the end, brings down Dagon's temple, knocking his pillars, killing himself along with all his enemies inside. Nobel Peace Prize winner Seymour Hirsch documented in his own book titled The Samson Option, Israel and the Bomb. Israel from its own inception has framed its entire national defense policy around developing nuclear bombs. Hirsch claimed that if necessary, Israelis are essentially willing to blow up the world, including themselves, if they have to do so in order to defeat Arabs and foes they perceive are a danger to Israel's survival. This glorification of founding suicidal combat is later revered going back to the famous mass suicide of Masada by Jewish zealots known as the Siege of Masada, with Roman troops at the end of the First Jewish-Roman War, just like what so-called alt-media sites like World Net Daily like to promote. Masada, the place we left, as Roman soldiers stood on the top Amidst the destruction 2,000 years ago, beholding the last Israelite soldiers having taken their own lives rather than give up, Israel was raised from the dead of history, that was her grave, and became a nation again. Although it's important to recognize Israel being founded in 1948 through modern day colonialization by European Zionist settlers in a wide range of attacks that in some cases did reach those sacrificial extremes before and after, they are in itself the innovations of modern terrorism by way of such Jewish paramilitary and terrorist groups as the Haganah, Ergun, and Sturden Gang, which now the West continues to suffer with its repercussions till this day. An episode that shocked the world in 1946 in the same way the Munich Olympic tragedy shocked the world last year was the blowing up of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem by Jewish terrorists. One of the leaders of Stern, now a political writer in Israel, was Nathan Yalinmore. Was not the state of Israel founded in part on the use of terror by Stern Gang, by Irgun? Of course I admit. So you, Special. a former member of the Stern Gang, respect the fighters of Black September? Of course I respect them. I know that, uh, yes, excuse me, uh, I would like to use the same methods as they use. Uh, because they do it differently than we did. As what Mike Wallace stated about the Munich tragedy shocking the world the same way as the bombing of the King David Hotel, the reality is with the American lexicon, especially today in regards to the foundation of Israel and terrorism in the Middle East, when the awful tragedy with the 1972 Munich Olympics is discovered in this day and age, it is simply thought of as Islamic terrorist by today's standards, but if you research the Black September and what actually happened through the almost 24-hour ordeal in Munich, West Germany, where Palestinian terrorists dressed in safari uniforms had taken members of the Israeli Olympic team during the Summer Olympics, known as the Munich Massacre, in which all 11 athletes and officials were kidnapped and killed, as well as a terrorist and a policeman, in a tragic failed rescue operation to thwart the members of the Black September from escaping with the remaining hostages to Egypt. But since we're on a roll with cinematic examples, if one were just to rely on Steven Spielberg's 2005 Hollywood movie Munich, which barely covers what all happened throughout the ordeal, viewers would be inclined to think these were just simply Muslim terrorists. However, if you watch the 1976 ABC made-for-TV movie 21 Hours at Munich, you will find some disturbing truths with the Black September leader over the whole ordeal, Lutif Afif, from within this scene during the hostage negotiation towards the press. My mother is a Jew, as a matter of fact. Why do you look so surprised? And Latif's father was also a Palestinian Christian. A very sad story indeed, considering what the qualifications are for Jewish birthrights and Israeli citizenship. But again, with Mike Wallace and the 60-minute piece. 
The fact is that innocent people die from terror, whoever the terrorist. The Jewish independence fighters, trying to hasten the exit of the British from Palestine and to intimidate the Arab population there, bombed bus stops and office buildings, railroad trains and shopping crowds. The fighters of Stirn and Irgun took a toll of innocent victims that ran into the hundreds. Leader of the Irgun was Menachem Begin, now a member of the Israeli parliament. We took all the risks possible in our lives during the fight. We never left this country. The British were here carrying our pictures by every policeman, every soldier. We took all uh, the risks involved in such a fight as everybody else. But I don't want any comparison, even by dissimilarity between us and the Black September and the Fatah. Uh, completely different uh, stories of a fight, either in the aim or in the method or in the intention. And let us not repeat that sacrilege, Mr. Wallace. It is sacrilege to you. Please. But apparently it isn't sacrilege if an Israeli wants to blow themselves up because the concept of a right-wing Israeli suicide bomber is plausible for being used in carrying out false flags for Israel's contingency. Because on October 18, 1983, a 22-year-old man named Israel Rabinowitz, who had arrived in the U.S. two weeks earlier carrying an Israeli passport, was arrested attempting to bomb the U.S. Capitol with two drink bottles filled with a powdered substance attached to his belt, wired to an operating detonation cap while approached in the House Gallery by officers for acting suspicious, where then he threatened to blow up the building. Police were able to detain him and he was charged for threatening to kidnap a person or cause bodily harm. And like the same old story we've heard before, he was eventually deported back to Israel a couple of months later. And looking at 9-11, some have suggested the possibility that three of the hijacked flights involved could have been carried out by Israelis taking on a suicide mission, either posing as passengers or even in some combination disguise with a real team cell of Muslim Arab hijackers, a suggestion based on accent of hijackers' voice from cockpit recording and early misreporting of hijacker identity either being reported alive or the inconsistent chain of evidence for 14 of the hijackers boarding three flights from Boston Logan and Newark airports. By all these examples and anomalies, we are not suggesting such an outsourced suicide mission or plan was carried out by Israel within the 9-11 attacks, but we are advocating that the attacks to take down the World Trade Center did mutate from Ramzi Youssef's original intention, already morphed with the Bojinka plot, and that in fact its method of crashing passenger airliners was in some part inspired by Japanese kamikaze pilots during World War II. But such violent ideas of twisted acts are no different than what's already been demonstrated by nostalgia with the wide range of cinema and television of yesteryear that has influenced all cultures in modern civilization. But Israel's sacred terrorism must be fairly analyzed and compared no matter how uncomfortably similar it is to the already familiar Islamic version of it. This is set to demonstrate the possibility of how both these worlds will and can overlap. Despite the differences of fundamentalism, whether each side is privy to all players in a big conspiracy, in every circumstance. And that just generally speaking, American conspiracy theorists or citizen activists are usually consumed by panic, depression, and paranoia, viewing the world through an orientalist lens, incapable of grasping the complexity of foreign state-sponsored terrorism added with an allied network of nebulous groups, thus unable to recognize the nature of problems at home and abroad, as well as international organized crime. I mean, think about it. Westernized, college educations, wearing Amani suits, hanging out in strip bars in the Philippines and Thailand? Does that sound like a fundamentalist Muslim to you? After the capture and arrest of Ramzi Yusuf's cousin in Karachi 2003, Amar al baluki he was kept in custody at an undisclosed location until 2006 when he was transferred to Guantanamo Bay. He was listed as a ghost detainee in the CIA prison system by Human Rights Watch in 2005. During al baluki's secret detention, he was tortured under so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Officials reported, al baluki was tortured and forcibly dunked into a tub filled with ice water repeatedly hit with a truncheon-like object and smashing his head to a wall. His torturous interrogation was fictionalized and depicted in the 2012 movie Zero Dark Thirty. It is said that al baluki had a copy of a Bin Laden letter to a Saudi scholar in his pocket, a computer disc containing a draft letter to him, two images of the September 11th attacks, and a perfume bottle containing a low concentrate of cyanide. He was also accused of discussing possibilities of exporting explosives to U.S. textile companies but then claimed of having no knowledge of such conversation. He is also fluent in English and worked at his uncle KSM's honey processing company in Karachi for a brief period before being hired in 1998 as a computer technician for Modern Electronics Corporation in Dubai. According to some evidence given at the Combatant Status Review Tribunal, he was very open-minded and Western-oriented, while his ex-wife Afia Siddiqui told investigators differently. 
Al Baluki requested his statements be garnered from MEC that would testify he had no connections to militant forces and that his employee records would show that he left days before 9-11 due to work permit being expired when MEC closed its branch in Dubai. The judge ruled it irrelevant, and the tribunal did not locate al Baluki's former MEC employees, but he submitted two statements written as to what he believed his MEC co-workers and his Israeli roommates would say. Israeli roommates? I don't know about you, but does it sound like al Baluki may have been set up? From what we've gathered so far about the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and what is widely known about the alternative 9-11 conspiracy theories, and without clear indication of where KSM was born, what ethnicity, and also in the same likes with Yusuf, added with those kept close around him, as then later with Amor al-Baluki, by this revelation, added with occupations and sources of income, could also mean that this so-called mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that's also currently in Gitmo right now, may just be an organized crime figure within the Arab underworld, with a genuine hatred towards the U.S. he sought revenge for, or could have been all of that, as well as an Israeli Mossad asset working ubiquitously for or within the loose base, aka Al-Qaeda. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or KSM, confessed to masterminding the 9-11 attacks from A to Z in a highly dubious, heavily redacted confession extracted after four years of torture in a secret CIA prison and after having his sons abducted and used as bargaining chips in the interrogation process. In 2006, KSM confessed to murdering Wall Street journalist Daniel Pearl. He claimed he had cut off Daniel Pearl's head with his, quote, blessed right hand. But because he'd said that while in U.S. custody, where he'd also been waterboarded, and because he'd been known to exaggerate, there'd been lingering doubts that alleged 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had really done that. He was never charged with the crime. Now, a report that seeks to erase those doubts. Ashra Nomani was a friend and colleague of Daniel Pearl's at the Wall Street Journal. She led an exhaustive investigation by a group of Georgetown University students of Pearl's murder in Pakistan nine years ago. The authors say they can pin the killing on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed because they analyzed an unusual technology called vein matching. They say at one point, the FBI asked the CIA, who was holding Mohammed, to take a picture of his right hand. Investigators took that picture and matched it against a frame in the video of Pearl's murder. In that video, all you can see of the killer, according to this report, is his hand. The report says the vein patterns on the hand in both images were a match. The FBI won't comment on the report. The report says a man named Omar Sheikh was wrongly convicted of actually killing Pearl, though he did allegedly set up Pearl's kidnapping. It says Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was asked by a top al-Qaeda operative to get involved because the kidnappers didn't know what to do with Pearl. At one point, this entire kidnapping could have gone a different direction, right? What we discovered was that Omar Sheikh actually had as his original ransom note that Danny would be released. And so the case turned and became murder. But it wasn't meant to start off as a murder, and Danny was actually supposed to be released. But the report says Khalid Sheikh Mohammed wanted to kill Daniel Pearl for propaganda. But unlike the torture stories we've been told about KSM, and as we've demonstrated by numerous witness accounts, U.S. secret agent Brian Parr stated that when Ramsey was taken into custody, Yusuf was friendly, he seemed relaxed, and he actually seemed eager to talk to us. So are these individuals known as KSM and Yusuf really who they are? Are they Arabs? Or are they Muslims? And, and let me ask you, I mean, you've been answering a lot of questions lately about uh, the newsletters that were published under your name, and some of the things contained in them were conspiracy theories. Some of the stuff was very incendiary, and, you know, saying that in, in 1993, the Israelis were responsible for the bombing of the World Trade Center. In his 2013 book, False Flags, Template for Terror, author Michael Collins Piper wrote, in comparison between 9-11 and the 93 bombing with KSM, Yusuf, and companion Ajaj, if the uncle and nephew teams really are Arabs and or Muslims, the fact that nephew Yusuf was working closely with a reported Israeli intelligence asset in the first World Trade Center attack is still noteworthy indeed, particularly since the Israeli asset in question was himself an Arab. So is it wrong and controversial for few daring investigative journalists, researchers, and officials, regardless of present Arab or Muslim involvement, but to speculate or conclude that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was in some part, if not in total, an Israeli Mossad operation? Especially those who are able to stick around eight and a half years later on the day of 9-11 and vindicated with the arrest of the dancing Israelis. 
and if that claim was supposed to be discounted, only then to be revindicated in 2009 when New York Times reported that Flight 93's hijacker pilot, Ziad Jarar, has a cousin named Ali who was arrested in Lebanon for having been a Mossad spy for 25 years. And also in the days after the attacks, despite other relatives, his immediate family refused to believe Ziad was even a fundamentalist or hijacked Flight 93. While at the same time, when none of the flight crew and passengers witnessed four hijackers, only that there were three hijackers on Flight 93. There are three guys who hijacked the plane. You know, he said his plane had been hijacked by three men. He told me that three people had taken over the flight. There are three men that say they have a bomb. And she said my flight had just been hijacked by three guys with knives. And while the cockpit voice recorder, which was played to victims' families of Flight 93 during the Zacharias Massawi trial, later transcribed and detailed that the Saudi, Saeed al Gamdi was in a cockpit piloting and not the Lebanese Ziad Jarar. And how can we forget his Egyptian confidant, Mohammed Atta, the proposed leader of the attacks, who not only had Mossad agents posing as art students living next door to him in Florida, but is also the first believed to be living hijacker after 9-11, due to the fact that his father said he got a phone call from him after the attacks, in which he also concluded and said who is ultimately responsible, Illa al Mossad and his once pink-haired stripper girlfriend, Amanda Keller, who not only partook in his drinking alcohol and doing lines of cocaine, but had also said he could speak Hebrew. Regardless if these guys ever hung out in mosques, these guys like to party, just as Ramzi Youssef and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed did. But neither of these figures are serious enough and actually fit the profile to take on a suicide mission. But in reality, they certainly likely knew how and where to find those who would. But has there ever been any evidence out there to tie KSM directly with the Mossad or Israel, aside from what we've demonstrated with his nephews? Well, it seems there is. According to Associated Press writer Jim Gomez on June 26, 2002, written in an article titled, top 9-11 suspect lived lavishly. After KSM had been revealed to be an organizer of 9-11 and on the FBI's most wanted list, the article details that Philippine police colonel Rodolfo Mendoza being public about his feelings that the 9-11 attacks were planned there in 1994, but that with the capture and interrogation of Abdul Hakim Murad from the subsequent discovery of Ramzi Yusuf's laptop left over in the apartment fire, the Bajika plot or plan was thwarted, but that it appeared KSM was also supervising the planning along with them there in the Philippines with a their operatives, but it also says in the article that a confidential Philippine police report prepared by Mendoza states that Mohammed KSM had traveled to Israel and the United States according to the report. <laughs> KSM traveled to Israel? What? Why would KSM travel to Israel? Can you say game changer? So yes, Michael Collins Piper could have been very well right. KSM could have also been an Israeli Mossad asset working ubiquitously or, or within Al-Qaeda with his anti-Shiite vitriol. But in hindsight, around the 93 bombing, it was not a wild accusation to charge such a claim for involvement by Israeli Mossad or Jewish organized crime. And if we need to include a semi-vindication again with the late world-renowned author of Jewish intrigue, Michael Collins Piper, where in his first book in 1993, Final Judgment, The Missing Link in the JFK Assassination, which it and all its editions was banned in several countries due to its controversial implications underlining the Mossad and Jewish organized crime. Yet in 1994, a year before William Kunstler passed away, he wrote an autobiography titled My Life as a Radical Lawyer, which he certainly was when you look at all the high profile cases that he defended, which coincidentally was also briefly this guy. Jacob Rubenstein, AKA Jack Ruby. Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. Well, not exactly. According to Kunstler's biography describing Ruby as a violent and mentally unstable person paranoid of pogroms and anti-Semitism, it states, When Jack told me he killed Oswald for the Jews, I believed him. On each of the three occasions we talked, he said, Bill, I did this so they wouldn't implicate Jews. Lee Harvey Oswald had belonged to Fair Play for Cuba, an organization with a number of Jewish members. Because of this association of Oswald, Jack's convoluted thinking led him to believe that the Kennedy assassination would be linked to Jews. Could Jack Ruby be a Samson of his time? So did William Kunstler's speculations and findings on Imad Salem serve him some merit for his cases on entrapment for the landmark plot bombers and or possibly being a Mossad or Egyptian asset? with closer oversight of the 1993 bombing than he proclaimed? FBI informant Imad Salem met us at Ground Zero and talked to us for the first time about why he risked his life to help the U.S. stop Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and his followers from bombing New York. The original plan that we should blow the bomb on December, which Christmas Day, to spoil the American Christmas. 
It was 1992 and Salem warned the FBI, but after he told agents he would never testify in open court and polygraphs on him were inconclusive, Salem and the FBI parted ways. But members of the terror cell again reached out to Salem, and again he went to authorities about how the terrorists were speaking in code. The Sheikh was furious that his right-hand man was actually an FBI informant, and Salem says the Sheikh later threatened him in the courtroom. He said, you're Satan. And of course, everybody knows what they should do for the Satan. Working undercover is not an easy task, especially with people who have no mercy. The guy is bad news anywhere he is. As long as he is alive, people get killed. FBI informant Imad Salem came out of hiding to warn about Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and how leaders like the president of Egypt continue to press for the Sheikh's freedom, while leaders from the Persian Gulf nation of Qatar have requested the Sheikh be transferred out of the U.S. When we going to wake up and smell the coffee? This man is dangerous in prison. What will happen when he's out of prison? If we today release him or like the State Department say transfer him. Is he going to be grateful to us? Absolutely not. He will kill Americans. He will kill anybody who will dispute what he say with a fatwa. I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm following Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman very closely. And sadly, for the first time since 20 years ago, he was taken out of prison, put in a hospital to prepare for his, what they call it, transfer. At the beginning, the State Department said, oh, we're going to release him. And then the media went crazy. You cannot release the guy has American blood on his hand. Oh, well, we will transfer him. And then this is, this is ridiculous. Shouldn't they have just been executed? Despite that it would be regarded cruel and unusual punishment executing a blind man, for a truth seeker or independent journalist, if Alex Jones ever had any credibility from the start to be labeled as one, who has spent nearly two decades blaming the 1993 bombing on the FBI, self-proclaiming it to be the concern which initiated his platform, it would be extremely clumsy and foolish, if not crass, to suggest capital punishment on the central suspect of the unresolved conspiracy, which would only be self-obstruction to puzzle the rest of the unsolved crime. And as Salem's appearance on the Alex Jones show, the blind sheik ended up passing away two years later in February of 2017. His body was transported to Egypt for his funeral. But it's still important to underline here how the blind sheik's imprisonment and the attempt to free him or transfer has been used as geopolitical bargaining chips, even with other terrorist attacks and kidnappings that have been carried out as a means to free Abdel Rahman. Even though by this point in the presentation, the blind sheik doesn't play out to be the trade center nor landmark plot, mastermind, ringleader, or central figure. But for Salem, he also uses the blind sheik's incarceration for his own agenda and cover. I will bet you something here. We have two or a year and three quarter left for Mr. Barack. He will release the sheik before he leave office to shut the Muslim Brotherhood forever. And you can quote me on that. Target. And the sheikh was convicted. He went to jail for many years. He just died this year. How does that make you feel? And is the world, uh, what, do you think that we're going to enter a more peaceful time? Or are there other people like the sheikh uh, who are, have already taken his place? Uh, on the contrary, I think we are in more dangerous before the blind sheikh passed away because a week before he passed away, he wrote his last will and testament and he ordered his followers to revenge for him. Quote, unquote, violent revenge. The blind sheikh had followers on the American streets. Today, they are waiting for the opportunity to have a violent revenge for his death. I guess whatever options that may have been put forth in either freeing or moving the blind sheikh ultimately didn't matter. And bringing any clarity to either potential circumstance of freeing the blind sheikh, despite the geopolitical vulnerability and dangers put forth on Americans at home and abroad, wasn't in Salem's interest. But he certainly sounds like a decisive fearmonger. This is a crucial point. It was not a black flag operation. It's not a false operation. It's a real crazy idiots, fanatics 
who wanted to commit jihad under the leadership of sure, the Sure, sir, I want to be clear and not split hairs here, Colonel. Of course, Alex Jones is not interested in bringing any clarity either as to what really happened, marginalizing sensitive details as just merely splitting hairs, when he also resists the opportunity of challenging Salem. Since the subject of 1993, he self-proclaims in his Shock Jock Radio Personality Foundation, and as a result has shaped much of his worldview, as well as his captivated audience. And even though he isn't entirely a reliable source at this point, instead of challenging Ahmad, Jones just follows up with his deficient and loose explanation of a false flag, which is actually to the contrary as to who pulled off the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. As yet, Salem has clearly indicated it's not a government false flag, which for himself being at the center to enable that accusation, he's right. So I wouldn't throw the blame on the FBI period that the, the listeners and you would like to understand because I was there. I walked the walk and I talked the talk and I am not afraid of nobody. If I am afraid, I wouldn't go undercover with assassins and evil doers. So nearly a year later on the cusp of Jones's historical interview with Donald Trump, Imad has a second interview with Jones on November 19th, 2015, where now Jones has slightly changed or phrased his overall narrative of what the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was. I mean, he was there, he tried to stop it, and was ordered to stand down. That's even been in the New York Times. Well, Alex, unfortunately, if we allow this group of Sin Sunni we have these people to enter into our land. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that it will happen again. We already got attacked in 1993 by the same group, however different name, it's all the same ideology. But again, I don't know if our government wanted that to happen again to start to take our liberty out of our hand more and more and put more restriction on the on the media and then they will say oops it happened again and they let these people to start to hurt uh, the american people to give them a reason to start to monitor more and to take our liberty out of our hands i'm not a conspiracy theorist but i am afraid that if they allow these people to walk in that's going to be a false flag operation to let them bomb america and then they say oops they bomb america we have to monitor america more and take your guns and take your liberty and take every even the mainstream media today start to be uh, controlled by the government. Yeah, sure. As if allowing groups of Sunni Wahhabists to come in and bomb America didn't happen before 2001 already, but now it's only likely to happen. Right. Of course, Salem doesn't want to spoil it for Jones's lucrative fear-mongering, and he certainly didn't want to give it away by resonating with Jones's anti-Obama position or his incremental re-embracing neoconservatism. Well, this is one of the policies Mr. Obama was trying to do. He is trying to control everybody in America, taking your rights, taking your guns, taking, stripping you from your rights so he can control you. You cannot defend yourself. You cannot stand up for your rights. Mr. Barack Obama's upbringing with a father who believed in fanaticism to the point that he named his first son Malik on God's name and the second son Barak, which is the right of Prophet Muhammad, Mr. Barak's heart is a Muslim. I have no problem with that because I am a Muslim myself. But don't go to the fanatics, take them over terrorist list, start supporting them, and then I have to pay the price as an American citizen. We are paying the price for increasing the power of the Muslim Brotherhood. Although we don't want to drift off turning this into a subject about Barack Obama, but rather about Salem himself after 2011, coming out of hiding with his appearances on Alex Jones in 2015 and after. But separate from the unexpected turnaround with Jones that was incrementally taking place shifting away from 9-11 truth years before, there's something to be said as far as ideological position, in how Salem perceives our elected officials, government and media, especially in regards to foreign policy, since only for the U.S., it's drastically changed as a consequence to 9-11, that could have only succeeded without the failure of 1993 happening first. Salem referring to Obama as a Muslim on the Alex Jones show isn't the only unusual remark he makes about the president or the establishment in which he's flat wrong on with his blanket assertion. He really takes it up a notch insisting that his Kenyan half-brother, Obongo Obama, 
is an extremist, that he's a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood in Africa, when in actuality, Obongo endorsed Trump, not the Democratic nominee as one would expect. Aside for Salem defending himself and supporting the official narrative of 9-11, it seems he still has other agendas just being obsessed with Obama, when he decides to rehash Obama attending services of Minister Reverend Wright, making accusations that the Muslim Brotherhood are blackmailing Obama, and that Egyptians are portraying him as a radical. If you see the intelligence on the Egyptian streets today, you can see how they portray Mr. Obama, how they portrayed him with the big beard and a turban. I want to go back to Mr. Obama's first speech in Egypt, in Cairo, Egypt. The first visit when he went there and he said to the Muslim Brotherhood, I am sorry for what America had done. I don't understand what is Mr. Obama apologizing for. America was a great deal of help to Egypt at that time. We were giving the Egyptian military 1.5 billion by the B dollars as an asset, as an help with their military. Obama has apologizing about what America is doing bringing democracy and trying to bring peace into the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> Mr. President, you castrated the American military and the American influence around the world. And we are not helping even our allies in the countries in the Middle East. Uh, on the contrary, he is trying to um, say that he is fighting the war, but we are making only five bombings a day. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Now, that would certainly be a good idea to help him bring peace and prosperity after the lies and cover-ups of 9-11. But separate from Jones's twisted logic, Salem certainly sounds like a neoconservative, too. And if, if Mr. Obama really loves the Syrian people, what did he do when the Syrian people got gassed by Mr. Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> what did he do about his red line to Mr. Assad if he gassed his people? <laughs> this is not America which I put my life and my family's life on the line for. Mr. Obama, please, please help America. Don't weaken America. America can lead the world. America cannot be led by Russia. Russia today have influence in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria. Sure, and let's just arm another Mujahideen all over again, since Russia is all over back in Afghanistan too. It seems to be working for us. Definitely a neocon. Unfortunately, that's the price the American people, you and I, will pay that we get alienated from the Middle East, and when we go ask them to help us to fight ISIS, of course they say, if you coming to support a terrorist organization called the Muslim Brotherhood, you coming now, one of the tales of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is ISIS, you want us to help you fight it? Sorry. And they walk away. And they went far from the United States to get their weapons from Russia and from China. And then... Lo and behold, Russia will start to spread their wings on the Middle East and we lose our leadership role around the world. America, I immigrated to is the United States of America and it is the supreme power on the planet and we should maintain that. Increase the military power and increase our leadership around the planet. Supreme power on the planet? Sounds like a tyrannical warmonger to me. I was happy to infiltrate people who are followers of the blind sheikh because the blind sheikhs commit the biggest catastrophe to my life assassinating my president on my watch. I was three to four hundred feet from the stage where he was assassinated because I was among the troops securing the parade. I was so very angry. 
and I promised him revenge. And that's because President Sadat uh, made the first attempts to make peace with, with the arch enemy Israel. Is that correct? Well, it was not an attempt. I mean, he was fought tooth and nail by the Arab leaders not to make this deal, but he stood his ground and he believed that Israeli people have the rights to live, Egyptian people have rights to live, there is no war anymore, and we're going to make peace, period. Uh, well, I guess that just confirms Salem as a Zionist. It came a day when I saw the blind sheikh having 63,000 U.S. dollars in a piece of newspaper wrapped, give it to uh, uh, Montasser Zayat, his uh, Egyptian attorney, and he said, give this Lil Hagga, Lil Hagga, which is his wife. Next morning, I contacted my Egyptian intelligence friends in Egypt. I said, Montasser Zayat coming back to Cairo, he have a newspaper wrapped under his clothes from the blind sheet. I think it has some instruction to his followers. At this point, it might be worth considering what Salem has admittedly disclosed here about having intelligence contacts back in Egypt, that he certainly must have also had contacts before he got involved with the cell the first time, which is one of the reasons why heads of the FBI didn't trust him, because they didn't know who he was ultimately serving. One of the greater reasons why to suggest Salem could have at least still had oversight or a bird's eye view of the cell members conspiring and making the bomb for the World Trade Center as it was also reported in New York Times on April 5, 1993, that Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak said that the bombing could have been prevented if U.S. officials had heeded Egypt's warning about an Islamic fundamentalist network in the United States. The disaster at the World Trade Center could possibly have been prevented. That from Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, who said officials here did not pay attention to warnings that an Islamic fundamentalist network was operating in the United States. Mubarak, who began a U.S. visit today, said his government has been cooperating with American authorities all along. There are definite informations being exchanged, and we still have cooperation in that field between the two intelligence for the sake of preventive, preventing these uh, terroristic groups. And could the World Trade Center bombing, do you believe, have been prevented? Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure of that, but maybe. And... Um, in, their in my conversation with them, they always say, let us to make them live in terror. And nothing be terror but terror. So we have to do military, and there is no mercy here. Looking back on everything from 93 to 9-11, being himself in the middle of its origin, Imad Salem is deeply invested in protecting the official versions, which is tremendously counter to Alex Jones' platform, who had long promoted the 1993 World Trade Center bombing as a domestic operation, claiming it as one of his founding wake-up calls, an inside job, as he still does for 9-11. But few have seen this Salem interview. Right before his second appearance on Jones' show, he did an interview with New York 9-11 truth activist Sander Hicks, where not only did Imad spend a great majority of the interview laying out the official narratives pre- and post-1993, even suggesting Mohammed Atta was taking orders from Osama bin Laden. But unlike other interviews, Sander with limited time and wanting to shift the conversation into areas of 9-11 that conflict with the official story, boldly went straight to this question. So I have a couple of other questions I want to run by you. It seems like you know a lot about 9-11 and it's great to talk to as somebody who's been inside the FBI. Um, what do you know? Have you looked into Mossad, the Israeli connection? There was uh, an arrest of several celebrating uh, Israeli... The who is full of explosive... Right, the moving van guys. The guys, there were guys from Israel um, who were videotaping the attacks and they were holding up cigarette lighters like it's a rock concert and they were high-fiving each other and they were arrested by New Jersey state, state troopers and then were released and they got back to Israel and they were on Israeli television. This is what really... There are two different groups. The people who were high-fiving each other watching the planes hitting, videotaping them, these people were not, was, was, they were not arrested and they went back to Israel and they submitted interviews to the Israeli TV and they acknowledged that they were taping the interview, the, the, the bombing of the, 19, uh, the 1991 World Trade Center. Uh, sorry. 2001. 2001. Right, right. Um, Israel is so powerful in the United States, um, nobody will deny that. And um, 
Is Israel is spying on uh, on the United States? Absolutely, I have uh, an um, intimate knowledge of that. Yeah, I think William Kunstler was onto something with his own investigations in regards to being tipped about Imad Salem receiving monies from Kahana Chai. Particularly when on his defense team, he had attorneys like Ron Kuby, who at the age of 13, after his parents divorced, joined the JDL under the influence of his father, who was a follower of Kahane, and immigrated to Israel as a teenager, but returned to the U.S. after being disillusioned by Zionism and Jewish extremism with its racism towards Arabs. But with the completely opposite end with Salem being the Zionist, even with his position of deniability in the conspiracy to build the bomb for the World Trade Center on February 26, 1993, with consideration that federal authorities are not entirely being forthcoming either. Salem was never considered trustworthy by the Bureau since the beginning. And just by examining a fuller-length recording of the public Salem and Antisev tape, rather than just a sensationalized soundbite taken out of context, which generically, in the minds of some truth-seekers, has been misconstrued as Imad Salem being a whistleblower, Salem was obviously an extortionist in regards to getting paid for his services. His excuses for quitting the first time likely had to do with the same exorbitant amount he asked for and got the second time around, rather than it just being over family death threats. Being that Salem's polygraphs tests were inconclusive, he could have been nefarious still, and had also been accepting other bids by organized interests, or had actual oversight or a bird's eye view on the operation making the first bomb, making certain or even alerting Egyptian intelligence at the bare minimum that the bomb was going to go forward. But in Imad Salem's defense, and unlike Alex Jones, there are some credible researchers who believe Salem was honest, like former ABC News correspondent Peter Lance, who has written a great deal about 9-11 and especially 1993 and Salem's role as an FBI informant. While at the same time, Lance has been critical in regards to heads of the FBI mishandling the investigations and other connected criminal activity concerning all the other suspects through terror cells and mosques, and there will be more to discuss about Peter Lance just ahead. But separate from the looming questions about Salem's bomb-making abilities or what was really being planned before he quit in 1992, the real question that should be asked is how were authorities able to quickly identify the proposed fill-in bomber, Ramzi Youssef, after Mohammed Salome's arrest and subsequent discovery of the three addresses he was linked to? So far, what we've seemed to uncover is a larger conspiracy in 1993 with other suspects involved, not caught, or followed up on. But you may have noticed within some images of suspects and on an earlier report, that there was at least one conspirator who wasn't captured, and that is the sixth suspect, Abdul Rahman Yassin. All the early books, documentaries, and feature films depicting the 1993 World Trade Center bombing before 9-11 shows no involvement with Yassin, when in fact he was actually arrested the same day as Mohammed Salome, but unlike all the other 93 bombing conspirators, he was the most helpful to the FBI, which in the long run, ended up protecting him and giving him a free pass. Yassin was born in Bloomington, Indiana by Iraqi parents where his father was getting a PhD and then shortly after moved to Iraq, where he was raised there, until he moved back to the U.S. in 1992, likely as a result from the first Gulf War the previous year. To get an idea of his story and what else was missing from the 1993 bombing, here is over 10 minutes worth from a rare CBS 60 Minutes episode with Leslie Stahl, who actually went to Iraq 10 months after 9-11 and interviewed Yassin. Over the years, the U.S. government was able to track down all the other co-conspirators in the 93 bombing, and bring them to trial. Yassin is the only one who's yet to be brought to justice in the U.S. We met him 10 days ago in this secret Mukhabarat facility for his first interview ever with Iraqi intelligence listening in. He seems shell-shocked, if not terrified, a shadow of the armed and dangerous fugitives sought by the FBI. Did you know you were on a most wanted poster in the United States? Yeah. Have you seen this? You know this. He told us he went to the United States in 1992 to join his mother and brother in their apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey. It was easy to get a passport because he was an American citizen. So how did he become a terrorist? If you believe him, it was by sheer coincidence. He says he bumped into two fellow Arabs living directly above him in the apartment building, Ramzi Youssef, and Mohammed Salome. We used to drink tea together. My mother used to cook for the young men lunch and dinner. Arabic food. Pretty soon, though, Youssef was recruiting him, roping him in through political indoctrination. As he describes it, he became the pawn of Ramzi Youssef. He was not charismatic, but he had a strong logic. 
He can convince people easily. He convinced me. So you're saying that, that Ramzi Youssef and Mohammed Salome, they try to politicize you. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. They tried and I was influenced. They used to tell me that you are an Iraqi and you have seen the destruction in Iraq. And they used to tell me how Arabs suffered a great deal and that we have to send a message that this is not right. This is to revenge for my Palestinian brothers and my brothers in Saudi Arabia. So they talk to me a lot about this. How did the operation get financed? I, I don't know. At first, he says, the plan was not to blow up the World Trade Center. Ramzi Youssef had something else in mind. He told me, I want to blow up Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn. U.S. officials say they never knew that Brooklyn neighborhoods, like Crown Heights and Williamsburg, were on Youssef's original hit list. Somewhere along the way, the plan changed. After a while, Ramzi Youssef told us to go to the World Trade Center. So we went there, walked around the parking garage, and he said afterwards, I have an idea. We should do one big explosion rather than do small ones in Jewish neighborhoods. Now you switch to the World Trade Center. What did that have to do with Jews? The majority of the people who work in the World Trade Center are Jews. So in other words, the purpose was still to kill Jews? In general, yes. You know that Muslims work there, that people of all religions work there, all nationalities. I am very sorry for what happened. I don't know what to do to make it up. My father died because of pain and sadness. It caused many troubles. I don't know how to apologize for it. Not only does he express remorse, something none of the others in the plot has ever done, Yassin incriminates himself in more ways than the government ever knew. For instance, you yourself went along to check out the Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn. You yourself went along to check out the World Trade Center with Ramzi Youssef. We went, the three of us, me, Ramzi Youssef, and Salama. So you, you were involved to the extent that you were actually helping them check out the sites. Yeah. Yes, I used to like to go out and see places. You knew that he was picking out things to bomb. Yes, he told me that. He also admits to helping Youssef buy the chemicals and equipment to make the bomb from this company in Jersey City. You knew who you were dealing with here. You knew, you knew that he had been trained to come to the United States as a terrorist to make bombs and blow things up. You knew that. I knew that after I started working with them. Work, he says, that included helping make the bomb, which was assembled in a separate apartment in Jersey City they had rented. You were mixing the chemicals. I never worked with chemicals before. That was not my field. But you were doing it. He was teaching us. He was the teacher. Me and Salame were the students under his hand. At one time during the work, as it spilled on my leg, I have scars on my leg. Did, did you help them load the bomb onto the van? No. Did you watch them do it? Yeah. You watched them do it? You didn't help because of your leg? Yeah. Was there a plan for what would happen after the explosion? Was there a getaway plan? Was there a, a rehearsal of what you would say if the police came? No, there was no specific plan. Ramzi Youssef did the operation and ran off. He left the others to their fate. He did not care. He just left. So you were on your own? <laughs> you were all on your own? A couple of days later, the FBI came calling. He says they broke into his apartment, tied him up, and conducted a thorough search. What they found, according to court filings, were traces of the bomb explosives on a scale, a toolbox, and a shirt. From the trash outside, they found the jeans he was wearing when he spilled acid on his leg, and torn pieces of a map showing the route to Youssef's other apartment. Before any of this could be analyzed, the FBI agents took Yassin to headquarters Yassin was so helpful, the FBI released him. 
He drove me back home in the FBI car. Did they ever ask you if you were involved in any way? No. They never once asked any question about whether you took part in this in any way? No. No. All the talking was on Ramzi Youssef and Mohammed Salame. Yassin reinforced the impression he was cooperating by voluntarily returning the next day and showing the FBI this apartment in Jersey City where the bomb was made. But the FBI agent didn't have a search warrant. He told me he could not go in because he didn't have a warrant. Your work with us is finished. And so he drove me back. He drove you back home? He drove me back. So they released him again. This time, he went straight to a travel agent, bought a one-way ticket to the Middle East, and flew off that very night, never to be seen in the U.S. till now. Iraqi officials say they allowed our interview because they have nothing to hide. Did anybody from Iraq send you to the United States? No, no. From the government? No, no. no. Were you in touch with anybody from the government? No. No. When I went to the United States, I had no idea about the explosion. I went there to live an ordinary life like any other American citizen. That's it. Why did you let him go? You have a guy in your hands with an acid burn on his leg who lives in the same apartment building as some of the others you know are involved. He knows names. He knows locations. Explain why the FBI let him go. It was a, a collective decision made uh, by, the, uh, by the FBI, by the United States Attorney's Office, whether or not that person, there was enough information uh, to, to hold him. And well, at he that had time, the acid burn. Wasn't that enough? Why wasn't that enough? Well, it was one factor. It was one piece of evidence. It well, wasn't he knew the, all the others. He, not all the others. He, he knew several of the others. He knew of them. There was not enough information to hold him and detain him. And... Uh, the, the decision was made uh, and he was uh, allowed to leave. I would imagine that so far with these 2002 revelations from Yassin and FBI's Neil Hermit brings some clarity as to how and why the 1993 World Trade Center bombing investigations unraveled so quickly in discovering Ramsey Youssef's residence and determining he was the mastermind. And also from Yassin himself, determines that whatever initial plans going on before and during Yusuf's arrival was about small and multiple bombing targets in Jewish neighborhoods, similar as to what motives were in place when Imad Salem had just left the circles, therefore the Twin Towers not verbally designated as a target yet. It may also seem to insinuate a very high possibility that Yusuf did also visit El Sayed Nosser in prison soon after first arriving. But if you happen to notice on the CBS 60 Minutes piece, it clearly identifies that the apartment building Yasin was living at also referred as a previous residence for Mohammed Salome living above, along with Ramsey Yusuf after arriving in the U.S., is none other than the 34 Kensington Avenue apartment in Jersey City, where Salome also used on the stolen vehicle report for the rider van in connection to the rental agreement, meaning that it was ultimately the residence of Mossad operative Josie Hadas. If the FBI's fumbling with handling Yassin wasn't enough to divert the public from looking into that apartment building as a hot address, then having a reported Mossad operative as a neighbor certainly would. Yassin was living with his family downstairs in apartment 4, while Josie Hadas apparently lived upstairs in apartment 8. At least some of the people there today tried to shift the blame for the bombing. Away from the Palestinian suspects in custody, Mohammed Salome and Nidal Ayad, and turned the blame to Israel. This paper handed out at the rally claimed Salome rented the van of death to do work for an Israeli secret service agent. However... One of many things that this 60 Minutes interview does not ask and fails to explain is that once Yassin fled back to Iraq, investigators subsequently tried to draw him back to the U.S., some with the aim of questioning him further and some in the belief that he should be arrested. But the channel of communication that's not being explained here is that Yassin's older brother, Musab Yassin, who was 34, a Ph.D. student in electrical engineering at the City University of New York, who also taught electrical engineering at Hudson County Community College and was repeatedly brought to the New Jersey FBI office to telephone his brother Abdul Yassin in Baghdad, Musab was told to say that authorities wanted Yassin to return just to ask him a few more questions. Only after local authorities finally came to the conclusion that their efforts to lure Yassin back were fruitless did they make the decision to indict him on August 4, 1993, some five months after the bombing. Yassin, who was 32 at the time of the bombing, is also an epileptic. 
and actually had a seizure while being questioned by the FBI, which might have worked in his favor in gaining sympathy and subsequently being let go. But Yassin ostensibly came in the U.S. for medical treatment for his epileptic condition arriving in New York in early September 1992. However, there are some peculiar circumstances to both his brother and his living arrangement at apartment 4, 34 Kensington Avenue, when looking for the entirety of Yassin's profile and background, primarily being the marital status of his parents, as no information is available as to what ethnicity their mother actually was and when she first moved into the apartment with Musab, nor any exact information where their father was living at the time. It was reported that city taxi records showed that Musab Yasin had a hack license from 1984 to 1990 and only lived in Iraq for four years. In fact, when Yusuf and Salome were injured from the car accident on January 24, 1993, they gave hospital officials their address as being Musab and Abdul Yasin's apartment four, on 34 Kensington Avenue, downstairs from their previous residence reportedly shared with Josie Hadass. And apparently, the vehicle Salome and Yusuf were in during their auto accident was a car previously owned by Musab, who had recently transferred the registration under their names, which was originally issued to an additional Brooklyn address of his. According to the New York Times on May 26, 1993, two days before the bombing, Mr. Salome was still being taught how to drive the van, according to court papers citing an FBI confidential informant, who did the teaching, federal authorities say that they are now searching for the informer and his brother. They say the two men are missing and may be in Iraq. One of the two, according to an investigator, is Musab Yasin, an Iraqi who taught engineering and briefly shared an apartment with Mr. Salome. But when it comes to newspaper coverage, there was one source which couldn't seem to let go of examining all the inconsistencies of those arrested and questioned from the apartment building. Even deeming it as the bombing plotter's den was New York's Newsday in an article on June 17, 1993, which had also pointed out that the Palestinian cab driver Bilal al Kazi had also lived there at one time, describing the place as two cramped Jersey City apartments strewn with mattresses, books, Arabic newspapers and fundamentalist sermons. They were students and cab drivers, men who work in stores and on construction sites, and that neighbors in the tidy working class area of Jersey City, New Jersey, were surprised that the kind, polite, helpful tenants could have had a more menacing agenda. They were polite and nice, said an elderly neighbor. They always help me with the grocery bags. The article states that they lifted fingerprints from at least 10 other people who they haven't been able to identify and who could be tied to the bombing. What those ancillary figures have told the FBI has never been released. The two brothers at least initially cooperated with agents and led them to the bomber's alleged makeshift laboratory before leaving the country for Iraq. The modest address became so pivotal that one law enforcement agent dubbed it the conspirator's den. There were a lot of people who lived there, said one law enforcement official early in the investigation. We're not sure how wide the circle goes, but we believe there were a number of people who knew what was going on. Early in the investigations, Agent was sure of one thing. The residents of apartment 4 took extraordinary pains to maintain their anatomy. Neighbors in public documents revealed that a former waiter and city taxicab driver named Mohammed F. Mohammed rented the three-room flat on the first floor two years ago when he moved to New Jersey from Long Island City in Queens. Muhammad has since been evicted and couldn't be located for comment. According to neighbors, Muhammad's apartment gradually became a safe harbor for impoverished young men with ties to the Middle East. Neighbors say as many as 20 others use apartment 4 and apartment 8 upstairs, holding meetings and prayers and eating large communal meals. Neighbors said that Salome, 25, the first bombing suspect arrested, lived in number 8, then moved downstairs to number 4, Muhammad's $560 a month apartment. This turned out to be misinformation, likely based on mixed accounts from suspects and witnesses that later changed their stories. In early reports, Musab Yasin claimed ownership to wires and electronic devices left over between both apartments, rather than Salome owning it which at some early point in the investigation, items left over were being used as evidence to convict him. But clearly, from what's been uncovered so far, even from the 60 Minutes piece, the Yasin family were certainly living in downstairs apartment number 4 during the Trade Center bombing. But continuing with the article, the men in apartments 4 and 8 were so close, added Mary Molpeter, a longtime resident, that they rigged up an intercom between them. About two months before the bombing, the men in apartment 8 moved out. Frank Ferrari, the owner of the building, insisted that no more than two or three people lived in either apartment and said the FBI asked him to withhold the names of the tenants on the next page towards the end. Two other men in apartment 4 came under scrutiny by the FBI. After Salome's arrest, March 4, Musab and Abdul Yassin were born in Indianapolis with relatives in Iraq. Both lived for several years in Baghdad, investigators said. 
Two days before the explosion, Abdul Yassin taught Salome, the suspect who allegedly transported the bomb to New York in a Ryder van, how to operate a similar type of van, court papers say. He also took agents to a nearby garage apartment where traces of the chemicals used in the bomb and laboratory equipment were found. Then Abdul went to Iraq and has declined to return, his brother Musab said. Through a spokesman, Dr. M.T. Mehdi, Musab Yasin and Abdul left with full knowledge of the FBI. Musab, 34, until last year, was a Ph.D. candidate in electrical engineering at the City College of New York in Manhattan, said he continues to cooperate with the FBI. Through Mehdi, Musab Yasin said he created the fictitious Josie Hadass, the name in which the telephone at Apartment 4 was listed, and a character some suspects supporters claimed really planned the bombing. He told Mehdi he made up the name in order to keep his engineering students at CUNY from calling his house. However, the phone bill in that name was not sent to 34 Kensington. It was mailed to the Brooklyn address where Yusuf registered his car. A man at the apartment declined to comment. Although things already seem very nefarious when it comes to Masab and him fleeing back to Iraq sometime after his brother, what's rather peculiar is his continued channel of communication and that he chose his spokesman to be M.T. Mehdi, if not Mehdi himself choosing or volunteering to intervene, especially since he's an Iraqi himself. But continuing with the Yasins, this detail with Musab using the Hadass name tied in with the phone number in the downstairs apartment, differs from the early reports with the name instead being used for the upstairs address with Salome and others. Musab's reason makes no sense, and his alibi is quite troublesome in contrast to the already aforementioned known Mossad name through Arab circles. Musab also gave conflicting information when he resided at that New Jersey apartment. Musab claims he first moved into the apartment about September 1992, but his name, address, and phone number appear in the January publishing of the New Jersey Telephone Book in 1992, before he changed it to Josie Hadass in August. According to what Musab told two newspapers, as well as a sworn affidavit, that he had already known Salome for a couple of years, and at one time first lived with him in apartment 4, before Salome moved upstairs to apartment 8, eventually becoming roommates with Bilal al Kazi at one point, and Ramzi Youssef. And based on the information that was publicly available at this point, before 9-11 and the subsequent CBS 60 Minutes interview nine months later, it may very well seem that Musab may have been handling, or at least was a secondary influence for his brother Abdul Yassin, to be involved or introduced in the circles of the Trade Center bombing conspiracy. But continuing with Leslie Stahl's 60 Minutes report on Yassin, Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz. He says that Iraq has been trying to turn Yassin over to the United States. But he claims the government in Washington doesn't want the $25 million fugitive. Twice we asked them to come and take him. They refused, Is which the means that they are not sincere in what they are saying. They are not honest in what they are saying, you see. The initial offer to turn Yassin over, he says, occurred during the Clinton administration in 1994, a year after that first attack on the World Trade Center. We informed the American government that we have important information about that event. If you are interested, send a team to Baghdad to get that information. They actually sent an emissary to the State Department to make the offer. They did not reply. They did not reply at all, and they did not... Uh, but your information was very vague, wasn't it? Yeah, but we showed our uh, goodwill. But would you really expect them to respond to that? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that we feared that uh, sending Yassin back to Iraq after arresting him and interrogating him, interrogating him was a sting operation. You, you thought that the Americans were trying to sting you by yes. sending him back? Yes. But for what purpose? To tell people later on that, look, this man who participated in that event now is in Iraq, etc., and use it as they are doing now, using many false pretexts, you see, to uh, hurt Iraq in their own way. To, win to suggest that Iraq was involved in the bombing? Yes, yes. So you, th you were very suspicious that he was some kind of plant or... Uh, we have the right to we have the right to be suspicious of the American intentions. He says their suspicions were borne out after September 11th when Yassin was put on the most wanted list. That he said led to another more specific offer. Dubbed Middle East analyst from DC-based Foreign Policy Institute and writer for the National Review, 
Lori Milroy, who authored the 2000 book, Study of Revenge, Saddam Hussein's Unfinished War Against America, in that there was an Iraqi Saddam connection to the Trade Center bombing, attempted to make a case that Yasin's brother Musab was behind it. Due to his vehicle registration exchange with Yusuf and Salome, Milroy mentions in her notes section towards the end of her book on page 293 in references, it says, Musab Yasin, I was exposed to American pressure to involve Iraq in the Trade Center bombing. Al Hayat, January 25, 1994. Yasin told Al Hayat that he was a Muslim fundamentalist but stayed away from its more extreme manifestations. But as Al Hayat noted, this does not really explain his good relation with Ramzi Youssef. Of course, if we fast forward, this does not pan out too well since Saddam was a socialist Baathist who hated Islamic extremists. And from what we can tell, Yusuf is no Muslim fundamentalist either. It's very possible that Musab and Abdul Yasin were willfully or indirectly participating in a terrorist action, knowing that U.S. retaliation would follow towards striking Iraq, in their belief not necessarily in spite of being Muslims, but of liberating their home country from Saddam and his regime, which could also be one of the reasons why Abdul is incarcerated in Iraq. Musab's whereabouts are also unknown. But none of these inconsistencies prevented Milroy in trying to make a case to implicate Saddam and the Iraqi regime being behind the Trade Center bombing and future terrorist attacks to come on the U.S., or even boldly stating that Saddam was in cahoots with Osama bin Laden. Aside from marginalizing or overlooking Mossab's usage of the Josie Hadass name, as a typical neocon propagandist would do, the main contention with her book is stating that Ramsey's real name is Yusuf, and that he's ultimately an Iraqi, based on allegedly falsified and doctored passports and birth certificates from Kuwait. But continuing a bit more with 60 Minutes. Aziz says Iraq made the offer as a way of proving that it wasn't involved in the 93 bombing and by extension 9-11. They're trying to prevent a U.S. attack and preserve the gains the country has made over the last five years. All the while in Washington, the debate over getting rid of Saddam Hussein is heating up. We asked the Bush administration to comment on the Iraqi offer to turn Yassin over. The White House told us to call the State Department, which told us to call the White House. Neither building would comment. So we turned to Kenneth Pollack, who handled Iraq issues at both the CIA and the National Security Council during the Clinton administration. He's now with the Council on Foreign Relations. Do you think that Iraq was involved in the 93 bombing? Uh, I've seen the CIA and FBI reports, and there is nothing in them to suggest that the Iraqis were themselves involved in the 93 World Trade Center attack. One of the things that uh, the Saddam Hussein government has been trying to do for a long time is open a back channel to the United States, to open some kind of a dialogue. Um, would there be anything wrong with doing that if, if, it, if it started over Yassin? I think that opening any kind of a secret back channel with the Iraqi government would be a terrible mistake. They would let the whole world know that the United States had been meeting with the Iraqis in secret. And that would feed all of these fears throughout the Middle East that the United States was always looking to cut a deal with Saddam Hussein. That we really wanted to leave him in power and wanted to get out of the Gulf. And that would leave all of our allies in the region high and dry. Yasin's ethnicity, being of Iraqi descent, was instantaneously exploited by the neocons soon after September 11th with revamping the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. In addition to past accusations of Iraq war crimes and violating UN laws, even before the mailed off anthrax letters started showing up, followed by the subsequent pretext phase with Israeli intelligence giving bogus intel about an Iraqi anthrax connection through a meeting in Prague with Iraqi intelligence and 9-11 ringleader Mohammed Atta, although blatantly anti-Saddam propaganda driven, Lori Milroy is, and has launched her career as a journalist in a joint venture with future fraud post-9-11 WMD propagandist Judith Miller. In a book back in 1990, Saddam Hussein and the Crisis in the Gulf was the first prominent publication that instigated American public support for Desert Storm, which was released in October of 1990. But something else about Milroy's motives and disingenuous assertion that Ramzi Youssef would be a prime Iraqi agent or that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was a conspiracy carried out by the behest of Saddam Hussein, is that she ignores Ramzi Youssef's only newspaper interview to Al Hayat, where he told Regida Durham, the United States is applying a system of collective punishment against Iraq and Libya. When either government makes a mistake, the United States punishes the people in their entirety for the government's mistake. We are reciprocating the treatment. 
But more importantly, what Milroy completely ignores is Yusuf's closing statement in court before his sentencing, proclaiming himself to be a terrorist. He said, And you killed civilians in Vietnam with chemicals, as with the so-called orange agent. You killed civilians and innocent people, not soldiers. Innocent people, every single war you went. You went to wars more than any other country in this century. And then you have the nerve to talk about killing innocent people? And now you have invented new ways to kill innocent people. You have so-called economic embargo, which kills nobody other than children and elderly people. And which, other than Iraq, you have been placing the economic embargo on Cuba and other countries for over 35 years. Yusuf additionally said, which is not in the public transcript but mentioned in a paper written in 2000 by John V. Parcini of the Rand Corporation, Saddam Hussein when he killed thousands of his people in the 1980s with chemical weapons, as further evidence of the U.S. government's disregard for civilian lives. Yusuf certainly doesn't sound like a fan of Saddam Hussein. And another major assertion made from Milroy that is flat out wrong is that Yusuf is an Iraqi. Well, I think that Mr. McCarthy understood from my briefing that his case was terribly weak. In fact, I view it as nonsense, this Islamic international jihad conspiracy. Now, if, you, if America wants to buy that, how about the conspiracy of Freemasons and Jews that overthrew the Russian czars? That if America will buy that, I'll sell them the Brooklyn Bridge. But to give some credit for what he stated before September 11th, Milroy was momentarily right on one thing when it came to the first attack on the Twin Towers, as pointed out as to why the U.S. government wouldn't extradite Abdul Yassin from Iraq. Quoted in the Boston Globe on January 17, 1995, Milroy said, I think that they have tried to make us comfortable with the assumption that the terrorists are all in jail and that the good guys won. We know, for example, in connection with the original World Trade Center bombing in 93, that one of the bombers was uh, uh, Iraqi, returned to Iraq after the attack of 93. And we've learned subsequent to that, since we got into Baghdad and got into the intelligence files, that uh, this individual probably also received financing from the Iraqi government as well as safe haven. Now, is there a connection between the Iraqi government and the original World Trade Center bombing in 93? Uh, we know, as I say, that one of the perpetrators of that act did in fact receive uh, support from the Iraqi government uh, after the fact. Even though it is often disputed whether Osama bin Laden really died in 2011 or had already died long before, as already aforementioned, the official status and theory regarding him and the September 11th attacks is that the FBI was never able to prove he had anything to do with 9-11, as bin Laden was only wanted for the East Africa Embassy and USS Cole bombings. So just from approaching this subject and unresolved matter, we already have problems putting bin Laden's face behind 9-11 and or KSM as a mastermind due to the conditions of his confessions and yet no actual evidence to prove they were the main planners or coordinators. In either case, it would seem that whoever was arranging these attacks structurally as an Arab or fundamentalist organization seems to have a mutual interest with Israel by carrying out terrorist attacks all too convenient to set up a pretext to strike Iraq and remove Saddam Hussein from power. But comparing in contrast with what we do know versus unanswered questions regarding September 11th that the more geopolitical enlightened within 9-11 truth that comprehends the role of foreign intelligence can see that Israeli intel is at fault and or behind the false pretext that misled to the disastrous war on terror in Iraq simultaneously as the Mossad in some great part being behind the attacks is rather easy to envision and implicate that at least at the bare minimum that the Mossad oiled the wheels of the Al-Qaeda Trojan horse. But coming back to 1993 and looking at this Jersey apartment building, with a trail and a good portion of conspirators already set, with the Iraqis, Abdul and Mossab Yasin, Mossad spy Josi Hadas as a neighbor above, who already shared Mohammed Salome as a roommate, an address that Ramzi Youssef was barely at, as well as over a dozen more suspicious occupants unidentified, this is all a big revelation, and you can see why just with Yasin alone, who was hidden from the official narrative for a great period of time, that federal investigators would have been persistent in diminishing any of the press's questions or follow-up reports over the address and their botched investigation with letting Yasin go, and not just over the inquiry by itself about Josi Hadas. And with this revelation also comes a greater revelation, not just because of the unanswered questions regarding Yusuf and his family background, but that he even first told others that he was an Iraqi when first arriving to the U.S., added with entering on a fake Iraqi passport. All of it very telling. But so is realizing that if Mossad asset Ahmed Ajaj had also been successful entering the country at JFK airport, he would have also likely been staying at the same apartment. 
Basically, you couldn't get any more effective being in that sort of company as far as what was witnessed and items found amongst these individuals, residences, and spaces added with training experiences and capabilities. It's no wonder that some law enforcement deemed it as the conspirator's den versus the Panrapo apartment garage address. But regardless if participants were incarcerated or not, the theory that Israeli intelligence would have known for certain what was going on, or worse, that they were in part managing part of the operation, is very possible, considering what we know happens eight and a half years later. But there are still quite a few unanswered questions about the Trade Center bombing, or at least the build up to it, ironically. Because you have to wonder, are we really to believe the FBI just hired Imad Salem to infiltrate mosques originally in 1991, just over the shooting of a racist rabbi? and some unknown Egyptian imam who only first appears in July of 1990, or were the feds already keeping an eye on the cell? As you may recall, it's obvious the FBI were already surveying the suspects who frequented the mosques before all of this, going back as far as 1989 with photos taken of Salome and Abu Halima with El Sayed Nosser at the Galveston shooting range. But for what in 1989 exactly? as no Islamic or Arab terrorist attacks had occurred on U.S. soil. Remember the ABC Nightline Investigate World Trade Center Ground Zero with Ted Koppel from April 1st, 1993? But by looking into their own existing files, the FBI has already discovered that it has dealt with some of these suspects before, more than two years ago. As you have looked now and gone through <clears throat> the records, of some of the men that, that have been arrested over the past few weeks. You have discovered that you'd met some of these guys before, right? Some of the individuals uh, have come to our attention in the past. Yes, they have. Not all, but several of the suspects now being held in the World Trade Center bombing had been identified as potential terrorists more than two years ago. Indeed, they were brought in by the FBI for questioning. During the Gulf War, uh, we took very seriously the threat to the United States from, from uh, terrorist elements. In fact, we tripled our commitment, uh, agent commitment, to terrorist matters during the Gulf War and, uh, and thereafter. Uh, some of the individuals involved in this case came to our attention as you can imagine. And it was in that context that you saw some of these men before. That's right. Among the charges that had been leveled but never substantiated against several of the men who are now charged in the World Trade Center bombing is that they had been overheard threatening to blow up a number of New York monuments. But back then, two years ago, the FBI was unable to muster enough hard information to warrant a full-scale investigation. As useful as that would sound for the neocons after 9-11, this nightline revelation just before the landmark plot sting in the immediate investigation of the 93 Trade Center bombing actually counters the current or official narrative. Why? Because if Nocer and Associates were under FBI surveillance this early in 1989, and with Nocer already imprisoned in 1990 after the Mayor Kahana assassination, during the peak of the first Gulf War in Iraq under George H.W. Bush Sr. This becomes troublesome for the time period. If Nusair was under surveillance, especially a year before, as noted from John Antisev's reaction to the writer Van Link, instantly recollecting Mohammed Salome at Galveston shooting range. In retrospect, if we process this early tip from ABC and Ted Koppel, which suggests that if these suspects were already able and planning to commit acts of terror, then it would have been seemingly in retaliation over the U.S.'s short-lived bombing campaign with Desert Storm in favor or for Saddam Hussein and Iraq. Why would this all then be contrary? Well, if we stick to the official story of the biographical profile of Osama bin Laden following the Soviet Union's withdrawal from Afghanistan in February 1989, Bin Laden returns to Saudi Arabia hailed as a hero of Islamic Jihad. But once he returned, he engaged in opposition movements against the Saudi monarchy while simultaneously working for his family business. But the following year, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait takes place under Saddam in August of 1990, an action that Bin Laden had a premonition was going to occur according to Saudi dissident Saad al Afaghi. Kuwait invaded by Iraq consequently put the Saudi kingdom and its royal family at risk with Iraqi forces on the Saudi border. 
which Bin Laden in return met with the Saudi Defense Minister Prince Turki bin Faisal, offering his forces, and that he could convince the Afghan Mujahideen to participate with fighting off the looming Iraqi forces rather than see the kingdom depend on assistance from the U.S., ultimately meaning that they would be occupied by what Bin Laden saw as an affront to Islam using Saudi Arabia, the holiest site in all of Islam with Mecca and Medina by Kufar non-believers who were allied with Israel. The kingdom flatly refused Bin Laden's offer and the Saudi monarchy went ahead with allowing deployment of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Shortly after, Bin Laden publicly denounced Saudi dependence on the U.S. military, which led to the Saudi Kingdom using the intelligence services, the General Intelligence Directorate, to suspend Bin Laden's passport and hold him under house arrest. This led to a secret meeting between Bin Laden and head of the Saudi intelligence, Prince Turkey bin Faisal, to meet, where he would offer Bin Laden an alternative, leave the Saudi Kingdom, and in return, his finances would be returned and his passport active. Bin Laden agreed, and in 1992, he relocated to the Sudan, where he was met with welcome in full accordance with Hassan al-Turabi, a popular Muslim cleric, which not long afterwards, Bin Laden still an obscure figure appeared on a top full-page portion in the international section of UK newspaper The Independent on December 4, 1993, nine months after the World Trade Center bombing, under the now infamous title, Anti-Soviet Warrior Puts His Army on the Road to Peace. And oddly enough, that year, less than two months after the World Trade Center bombing, the H.W. Bush assassination plot was uncovered in Kuwait to target the former president right before his scheduled visit to Kuwait City on April 14th to commemorate the international coalition victory against Iraq in the Persian Gulf War. Clinton was convinced the attack was masterminded by the Iraqi intelligence service by false claims, mainly based on confessions extracted through torture that were then later retracted. But despite all that, President Clinton launched a Tomahawk cruise missile strike in Baghdad on August 26th. In retaliation, an attack that just happened two days after the New York Landmarks raid in Queens. Later on in October, New York investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch will state that the government's case was seriously flawed, noting that seven bomb experts had told him that the devices were mass produced and probably not manufactured in Iraq, and that an analysis by the CIA's counterterrorism mission center concluded the assassination plot was most likely fabricated by Kuwaiti authorities. This incident was later cited as justification by junior president George W. Bush for the illegal Iraqi invasion after 9-11. And astonishingly, this assassination attempt on his father was never actually solved, which then leaves the open question as to who actually organized or contracted it. Or in the corruptive nature of the State Department or U.S. intelligence, no attempts are known of cultivating an Al-Qaeda link from it, not even in retrospect. And the reason could be based on impossibility of Al-Qaeda still in its developing stages. Because according to staff writer for The New Yorker and author of the 2006 book The Looming Tower, Lawrence Wright, that from notes taken at a meeting on August 20th, 1988, Al-Qaeda was a formal group with Abdullah Azam, which by that time Bin Laden had already split from the Maktab al Kidamat, wanting a more military laurel. This in turn becomes a basic revelation of an organized Islamic faction, and its goal is to lift the word of God and make his religion victorious. However, three months earlier, on May 29, 1988, Osama's oldest brother, Salim bin Laden, had died in San Antonio, Texas from a Sprint ultralight aircraft accident crashing into high-voltage electric power lines. Salim bin Laden's death was a devastating blow to Osama and essentially a point of newfound hatred for the U.S. as he had looked to Salim as being a dominant family figure and as the founder of the Saudi bin Laden group managing the family's extensive investment and income distribution and consequently, as yet their own father, Mohammed bin Laden, was also killed in a plane crash in 1967 at the hands of an American pilot. So considering these points in 1988, and then the following year, with the Soviet Union's withdrawal from Afghanistan in February, and then also by November 24, 1989, with Abdul Azam being assassinated by a car bomb in Peshawar, all while simultaneously throughout that year in the U.S., the Fed, for some given reason, are already surveilling El Said Nasser and company. This point in time, Al Qaeda as an organization is not developed as a terrorist network then. Contrary to what National Geographic and other official narrative defenders suggest, Azam's death may have been a plot from the CIA, bin Laden, 
and Ayman al-Swahari themselves, or even Israeli Mossad. Azam's murder still remains unsolved. By 1990, with Nocer assassinating Mayor Kahana on November 5th, Operation Desert Shield, which was the buildup of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia, which was still in effect until January of 1991, when the real conflict began under Operation Desert Storm. And not long after, Azam loyalist Mustafa Shalabi is also found murdered in his New Jersey apartment on February 25th. And it's true, according to what evidence suggests, that Nocera's cousin, Ibrahim El Gabroni, did travel to the Middle East, raising money for the defense fund for his cousin, where Osama bin Laden is said to have been a contributor while in Saudi Arabia and had also suggested hiring William Kunstler. And long afterward, when it came to Ramzi Youssef, bin Laden acknowledged who he was, but never claimed to personally know him, according to what he said with John Miller for ABC News in May 1998. Ramzi Youssef was a follower of, follower of yours. Do you remember him? Did you know him? Ramzi Youssef. After the explosion that took place in the World Trade Center, Ramzi Yusuf became a well-known Muslim figure. Muslims have come to know him. Unfortunately, I did not know him before this incident. I remember who he is, and he is a Muslim overtaken by zeal for his religious due to the chauvinism and oppression practiced by America in Islamic lands. So, he made an effort in making Americans understand that their government is aggressive against Muslims in order to safeguard the Israeli interests in Jews. So America will see many of the young people imitating Ramzi Youssef. Is it true that when Ramzi Youssef was captured, he was in a guest house that you were paying for? Based on what has been reported in the news, we learned that he was unfortunately captured by American intervention in Pakistan in some hotel. If the present injustice continues with a wave of national consciousness, it will inevitably move the battle to American soil, just as Ramzi Yusuf and others have done. This is my message to the American people. I urge them to find a serious administration that acts in their interests and does not attack people and violate their honor and pilfer their wealth. Though there are certain overlaps with those that are deemed as al-Qaeda operatives, it makes no sense why bin Laden would have networked or admired the KSM family with Yusuf with their vitriol for Shiite and Persians when bin Laden himself had no qualms against Shiites nor especially the nation of Iran, which he had even visited, as well as one of his sons who had lived there for a long period. Aside from the historical record puzzled well after, which puts bin Laden as not having been responsible for any terrorist attack until 1992 with the bombing of the Gold Mihor Hotel in Aden, killing two people, for this alleged Al-Qaeda or Bin Laden Association time frame back in 1990, specifically regarding Nocera's assassinating Kahani, this notion becomes not only a question of how, but about why. Why then would Bin Laden be interested or network with Nocera, who's already suspected of possible militant or terrorist activity during the Gulf War, which would garner more U.S. military activity within Saudi Arabia and the region, contrary to what Bin Laden wishes? adding that bin Laden was no fan or friend with Saddam Hussein or Iraq when he offered his Mujahideen to fight them. This also brings about the question of how. How could bin Laden be involved or network with Nocera in 1989, when bin Laden is still in the process of transitioning with both Abdul Azam being alive and the blind sheikh still requiring another year until he appears in the U.S. overstaying his visa to move there? The reason why this really matters, or that it comes all down to Nocera, is that due to the subsequent search of his apartment after the Kahana assassination, in which they found enough evidence asserting that he was plentifully capable and planning further terrorist actions, with a list of 12 other assassination targets of prominent Jews and New York officials, plus targeting the Twin Towers and other New York skyscrapers. Peter Lance, who has written three extensive books on 9-11, one particularly addressing the case of Ali Muhammad, the triple agent for the CIA, FBI, and Egyptian Islamic Jihad, who first came into the U.S. 
working as a translator for Ayman al-Zwahiri's first U.S. tour of Islamic mosques. Even though Lance has been a great researcher who has uncovered links that the authorities resisted connecting, he suggests that Ali Muhammad was ultimately Nosair's handler. But this would be challenged ahead, as it should be recognized chronologically with early conspirators having resided some years back in the U.S., such as Wadi al-Hajj, but El Sayed Nosair first immigrated to the U.S. in 1981, while Ali Muhammad first moved in 1986. Even if Nosair had served in Afghanistan, which has never been documented or proven, looking at this time frame in 1990, following these trails of suspects, as well as those that do appear in 1993 after Imad Salem's disappearance, it's more than likely that Nosair may have been taking orders elsewhere, particularly in regards to what's plausible and what this position Osama bin Laden was at and still connected to at this time. But Nosair was certainly the one who was guiding or what was the actual ringleader of the World Trade Center bombing conspiracy and not the blind shake. So in retrospect, if the warning signs of striking New York existed before the 1990s and what appears to be the case with Nosair, as even indicated from what DA Mary Jo White and that also Bin Laden's ineffectiveness then and still unproven status now for being responsible or masterminding both attacks on the World Trade Center starting from 1993. Then the real question that needs to be posed is just who is ultimately responsible for targeting the Twin Towers, thus the true mastermind of 9-11. But just for the sake of argument, entertaining the idea in which Ali Muhammad was no Sayers handler, this would still significantly show the ineffectiveness of both Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden in the early 90s. Because admittedly, with the circumstance of Ali and his egotistical attitude, he made it very clear that he didn't need Osama bin Laden or a fatwa to be active. Despite his activities in the 80s that predate Al-Qaeda, this was demonstrated in the mid-90s, right before the East Africa embassy bombings, while during the trials of the Trade Center and Landmark bombing conspirators. Ali Mohammed is indeed in California, but only a few FBI agents know about it. Remarkably, he has just accepted a dinner invitation from Jack Clunan, who is trying to use him. He was obviously very suspicious, um, and for good reason, because he knew what he had done over the years and who he was close to. So he showed up for dinner one night uh, with a couple of agents and a, a very great uh, assistant United States attorney named Pat Fitzgerald. And we talked to uh, Ali that night, and I remember the, after con the conclusion of our dinner and our talk, Pat Fitzgerald looked at me and said, with kind of a wry grin on his face, he said, this is the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous men I've ever met. And we decided that we needed to gain his cooperation because he was telling us all kinds of things. He was telling us he could vanish whenever he wanted. He had contacts overseas. He was sort of, in effect, operational. We thought at first it was all bluster, that he was just making those things up. But the more we dug into it, the more we realized that um, this was a very serious guy that understood um, the history of Al-Qaeda, understood what was going on in Afghanistan, had been in Afghanistan, had helped set up training camps, knew where the training camps were, and knew what the syllabus was for training Mujahideen, had been operational, and so we'd set out to, to um, gain his cooperation. But as the story goes before all of this, with Ali prior to being recruited from CIA offices in Cairo, he then later moved to North Carolina, and enlisted in the U.S. Special Forces. Not only did he train inactive anti-Soviet Afghan Mujahideen in the early 1990s, but he also trained al-Qaeda volunteers and allegedly Osama bin Laden and al Swahari. While on the East Coast and based on the discovered Fort Bragg Army training manuals after the Kahana assassination, it's believed Ali trained Nusair and Mahmoud Abalima which is why Ali already became a person of interest to U.S. authorities before the Trade Center bombing. Ali Muhammad was later charged for his 1998 East Africa embassy bombings before attempting to leave the United States in 1998, as was Wadi al-Hajj, who was also linked through telephone records to Ali while living in Northern California. In addition to Ali Muhammad's native Arabic, incidentally, He is adventurous and well-educated fluent in English, French, Arabic, and Hebrew. As far as Ali Mohammed's incarceration, it's been kept secret from the public due to reports in October 2001, as a consequence of 9-11, that he may have been cooperating with the U.S. government 
and according to former FBI agent Ali Soufan in 2012, he confirmed that Ali is still awaiting sentencing. But interestingly, Ali Mohammed's fate was far different than another suspect he was connected to while living in Northern California. Through Wadi El Hage's number in Nairobi, Kenya, was Mohammed Jamal Khalifa, a brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden. In December of 1994, Khalifa was arrested and detained for several months without bail in Mountain View, California on charges related to the 1993 bombing, where all of a sudden, with no explanation, he was deported to Jordan to face conviction for a sting of theater bombings, which in happenstance, his conviction there was already overturned due to witnesses recanting their testimony. Khalifa then left for the Philippines and returned to Saudi Arabia, where authorities claim he was found to have been funding the Bojinka plot, by five phone numbers of him found at the Joseph apartment in Manila, where Yusuf's bomb factory and laptop was found after the apartment fire. Khalifa confirmed that he knew Pakistani Wali Khan Aman Shah, and was a high school student of his when he was a teacher in Medina, Saudi Arabia. And ironically, so did Osama bin Laden acknowledge who Wali Khan was, and spoke highly of him during his interview with John Miller. Shah was arrested by Manila police at another apartment on Singalong Street, which Yusuf had set up in case the Bojinka plan failed. But with Khalifa in the middle, this does show a potential overlap or degree of association between Yusuf KSM family and Bin Laden. The day before Khalifa's 50th birthday in 2007, he was killed in southern Madagascar while visiting a gemstone mine. Reports state that around 25 to 30 armed men raided Khalifa's residence in the middle of the night, attacked him with various weapons, and removed his computer and other intelligence materials. His family believed that he was assassinated by Joint Special Operations Command. But still, if they were able to prove, even if circumstantially, that Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law was involved with the Bojinka plot, where Yusuf and his uncle KSM certainly were at, even if dead, then why haven't the FBI been able to prove bin Laden was behind 9-11, and only have him charged still for the USS Cole East Africa Embassy bombings and small terrorist attacks throughout Africa and the Middle East, and not 9-11. And not to mention, neither the 1993 World Trade Center bombing either. Aside for El Said Nosser, those reasons not to originate 9-11 or the Trade Center bombing plan to OBL could rely both on impossibility and Ali Mohammed solely. With his military experiences and activities years if not a decade before Al-Qaeda is born, and not being an original participant in the narrative role of being president in Afghanistan or Pakistan, until much later after the war against the Soviets was over. And with so many unanswered questions and cover-ups regarding the destruction of the World Trade Center, if you think the Bojinka plot doesn't ultimately matter in regards to 9-11 just because there's an official narrative of only four hijacked planes, it would be worth reconsidering that as with Ramzi Yusuf said in his only interview to Al Hayat newspaper about a new Islamic militant group that would rise up and challenge the U.S., Ramzi Yusuf certainly could not have been declaring vengeance be carried out under the limited and official scope of only 19 hijackers and four airliners, especially if we know there's been planned coordinated bombing strikes on the U.S. several years before 1993 during the first Gulf War. Was Yusuf warning of someone else finishing out the total third phase of the Bojinka plot as 9-11? Finishing something he didn't even start? Regardless of targets or if there was someone else behind Osama bin Laden or even Yusuf and KSM who was also said to have traveled to Israel right before the discovery of the Bojinka plot, how serious of a roster of hijacking teams or militants were here on U.S. soil in the fall of 2001 as even what Colonel Mendoza forewarned about actually might have been possible in the original 9-11 attacks. If you want an answer to this, watch the other extensive six-hour film, 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, Untold Hijacking Attempts of September 11th and 13th from 2020.